Good day, Jackson. I'm Marshawn Crystal, and this is WAJ. We are Jackson City View. Uh, this is a first segment of many uh, where we'll be having uh, different guests in the studio discuss different topics that we think uh, here in the city of Jackson are very important to our citizens. These topics will range from uh, various things that deal with health and welfare issues and certainly uh, public safety issues. Uh, that here in the city of Jackson, our number one priority is make sure we have a healthy and safe community. Today we'll have on our show two guests that will be discussing those type of topics, uh, from fire safety to breast cancer awareness. And we'll be having again other guests uh, throughout uh, the week and throughout the uh, month to discuss a similar type of topics. And uh, we hope and trust that you will continue to uh, watch our program and let your family and friends know that we are bringing topics uh, to the forefront that we feel like are important uh, to uh, the citizenry. Again, our first two guests will be discussing issues uh, ranging from fire safety and breast cancer awareness, so please tune in. AmeriCorps strengthens communities and develops leaders through a community service. Are you ready to make a difference? AmeriCorps allows you to use your energy and talents to help others while earning money and gaining job skills. If you are age 18 or older, AmeriCorps is waiting for you. Welcome to our WAJ studio. Today we have with us uh, the illustrious Chief Cleo Sanders, who is here to discuss about things dealing with the Jackson Fire Department that range from uh, fire safety all the way to how citizens can get involved in making Jackson a safer place. Welcome, Chief Sanders. Thank you, sir. We're Thank glad you. to have you back in the studio. It's not your first time here, and we appreciate you always answering the call, not only just the fire call, but certainly the calls when we uh, ask you to come in and certainly share with our citizens the importance of you know, fire safety and being very much uh, aware of how fires can certainly not only in, endanger people, but certainly can certainly take lives. So we want you to you know, come as you usually do and just kind of explain to the citizens some of the things that the fire department is doing right now to make uh, you know, citizens more fire safety aware. Yes, sir. And as always, we appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you and the citizens yes, about sir. what's going on with the fire department. Yes, sir. Um, you know, our number one thing as a fire service, you know, we just want people to be safe when it comes to dealing with fires. You know, we hate to see any deaths behind accidental fires. So, you know, we preach on a day-to-day -day basis and try to educate our citizens and the public about being safe when it comes to dealing with fires. A, a large majority of our fires are ac accidental fires. And if we can plant that seed to get citizens to be more safe we can cut out a lot of accidental fires uh, during the course of a year. Well, good thing. And, and, and one of the things that I, I particularly appreciate is that you all are proactive. I know you all go out to the communities and certainly do uh, displays. You also do uh, certainly uh, presentations within uh, community association and things of that nature. Do you all actually uh, do uh, presentations in the schools, on, on both at the collegiate level and on the secondary school level? Do you all do those as well? Yes, sir. Well, we have a great fire safety education division. Chief Alexander and his team, they do, they do a great job along assist, assisted um, in those efforts with our firefighters. And they go out and they do have fire safety events at churches, schools, uh, just wherever a request comes in at um, any time a person, ha or if someone is having an event and they are seeking some fire safety education material, uh, I just encourage them to call 601-960-1399 and Chief Alexander and his team, they are always readily available to go out and meet that need. And when it comes to information uh, per pertaining to fire safety, I mean, you can't beat them. They're hands down. They do a great job with getting the, getting the information out. Well, that's fantastic. And I know how important it is, certainly, to properly educate the public on uh, you know, the threats of fires and things of that nature. I want you to take a few minutes to talk a bit about that. What are some of the most common threats that you, in your experience, have seen in terms of uh, residential fires or even uh, commercial fires? Well, number one, cooking. I mean, unattended cooking. Uh, we have seen a great vast amount of fires where they result, the result was, um, and it was an accidental fire, but it was just unattended cooking. We have um, residents may come home late at night, hungry, go ahead and, you know, try to cook them a hot dog or fry up some french fries and mess around and go and lay down and go to sleep to where, you know, the fire 
jumps out of control, they wake up, and then instead of them being able to extinguish a small fire, you know, they have to call our call 911 so the fire department can actually come out and assist. And one thing that I do want to say to our uh, residents is that if the fire is small enough to where you can extinguish it safely, then, you know, we encourage you to do that using the, the uh, lid to put over the, the uh, pan or actually using a fire extinguisher or possibly, you know, some baking powder. But if it's not, uh, if the fire is not safe enough for you to be able to extinguish, we encourage our residents to dial 911, get out the house. Once you're outside, stay out. But accidental fires, because of unattended cooking, are a vast majority of the fires that we respond to. And I know a lot of people are naturally reactive and they want to save their uh, precious uh, uh, resources and certainly their uh, home uh, and things of that nature. So they are reactive when it comes to trying to like you say, extinguish the fire. And so you, you share with us the do's. Talk a bit about the don'ts. What, what shouldn't a, uh, a, a resident do in terms of fighting the fire, other than the fact that once you determine that it is bigger than you can manage, what are some of the things that they should not do when they're trying to extinguish a fire? Well, number one, if it's a grease fire, you definitely do not want to put water on it. <laughs> a lot of people think that's the right way to go, but that's, that's the absolutely <laughs> worst thing you can that's do. That's right. right. You yeah. definitely do not want to do that. When you're actually frying in the kitchen, we ask that you do not leave the kitchen. I mean, stay inside the kitchen while you're, you're cooking. We ask that you uh, never, never leave the uh, items unattended. And that is, 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 is one of the you know, biggest things. So we ask that you stay inside the kitchen. We ask uh, if you do have a fire and you're not able to safely extinguish it, exit the home and do not re-enter the home. You know, your life is, uh, everyone's life is, you know, matters to us and is very valuable. And so those material things, we can replace those things. So number one, once you're out, we encourage you to stay out, leave it up to our firefighters to come and uh, extinguish that fire. Some of the most disturbing scenarios we hear as uh, citizens and, you know, viewers of, of the news, as much as you can take uh, that as being actual and factual, is you, you hear reports all the time about, how people do go back in the home because they may have left one of their loved ones or children. And can you explain to the public, even though you know that that's what you want to do and you want to try to save them, why is it important not to go back? Now, what are some of the things that a, a person would face going back into the house? Well, they face becoming, going inside and being overcome by the smoke, the heat, and the gases. Mm -hmm which will render them unconscious. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's very important that once you're outside of the home, you make sure you stay out, do not go back in. You're more valuable as information to us when the firefighters arrive on scene to where if you're, someone is inside the home, you can kind of direct us to saying, hey, they're in the back bedroom, you go towards the, um, go down three doors down the hall and take a right. You know, you're more informational to us then. So we just encourage the, the residents, like I said, once you're, you're out, stay out because we, we don't want it to be uh, more, any more dangerous to you than it should be. I, I wanted you to uh, certainly speak on that a, a little bit more because a lot of people are uh, misconstrued not seeing flames with the house not being as dangerous. In other words, a lot of times, if, Flames have not overtaken house, but the smoke has. Yes, sir. And so people have a tendency to say, well, I don't see a lot of fire. Mm -hmm. I could just go back into the house. And they don't understand, like you say, the smoke, the gases, mm -hmm. not being able to breathe mm -hmm. is what a lot of those uh, fire deaths are, are attributed to. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that's what we call smoke inhalation mm -hmm. has been determined. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as you said and stated that there may not be a lot of fire, but the smoke is more deadlier. Mm -hmm. The smoke will, as I stated, you know, it would deprive the, the the person of their ability to breathe. And like I said, most of the time people will be rendered unconscious and we have had uh, deaths where the cause of the death was, uh, it was determined to be smoke inhalation and the person did not have a burn on them. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the smoke and the superheated gases inside of the, the structure, you know, those are very deadly. That's why we encourage everyone, even if there's a fire inside the home and you're actually on your way out, if it's smoky, drop down to a knee level and crawl. We encourage our residents to make sure that you have at least two ways out of every room. We wanna make sure that each person 
uh, in that home knows the escape plan if in the result if there is a fire so uh, it's, it's very paramount that if a home if a uh, home does not have a, a escape plan you know we encourage you to get with our fire safety education division to allow them to help you to uh, develop a plan if you don't have one because we know and we have always learned that having working smoke detectors you know have saved lives so we want to make sure that we have uh, working smoke detectors inside of our homes we want to make sure that we have a working uh, knowledge of a home escape plan and we just want to make sure that we're, we're safe when it comes to to uh, being fire safe that's precisely why i wanted you to go a little bit more in detail about that because i know a lot of times people get confused by that whole notion of uh, of, of what really uh, kills a person in terms of house fires. You know, when I looked at statistics and what they showed, this alarming rate of how people are dying from smoke inhalation yes, and not sir. being burned, mm -hmm. you know, it's worth having that conversation because yes, a lot sir. of people still have a tendency to want to go back into the house. So thank you for sharing with that. That's, that's some very helpful information. Let me, in uh, other words, segue into another important event that's coming up with the fire department. I understand you all have a new, an another rather, uh, uh, Citizen Fire Academy coming yes, up. Sir. Tell us a bit about that. Yes, sir. Well, it's, it's our privilege to uh, offer a Citizens Academy to our residents at least three to four times a year. We want to try to have one every quarter that will give our citizens opportunity to come out, meet your local fire department command staff. They will uh, come out and learn more about fire safety education and really they will learn about each division of the Jackson Fire Department. Uh, this will not just be a lecture-based class, it will be hands-on tr um, things that, activities that will be going on for the whole week. The Academy starts on October the 31st, which is Halloween, and it ends on the 5th, which is that Saturday, mm -hmm. which is that Saturday, and it ends on the, on the Saturday with our uh, participants going out to the fire stations. They're going out to the fire stations and see how the firemen spend their time on a 24-hour daily basis when they're away from home. And then the class will in, actually end on November the 7th, which is that Monday, and it'll be graduation. So the, fire, the uh, participants will actually have a graduation ceremony, and they will also experience a great meal that will be that'll be prepared by our firefighters. I can attest to that meal, man. I'm telling you, that's what, it's, it's worth to go one week just to get the meal that y'all serve. Y'all yes, do sir. a great job on there. But one of the things I want to talk real briefly too is you all have some exercises, I imagine, that the uh, participants will be able to uh, certainly experience. Will they be able to put the gear on? Will they be able to get the fire hose? Yes, I mean, how, how much activity would they have? I know they're interested in hearing that. Okay, well, each night a different division will be represented uh, as you stated, the night of, of uh, where the participants be able to put on gear would be our training division night. So they will actually get a chance to put on gear. They will actually get a chance to look at some of the tools that the firefighters use on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Wednesday night, they'll be able to go to our communication center to see where 911 calls come in and actually how they are dispersed. Uh, we do have uh, our fire safety education, which is uh, the very most important where they'll actually learn how to use a fire extinguisher. They will learn the importance of uh, checking your, making sure you have working batteries, good batteries inside your smoke alarms and when and how often to test them. Uh, on my night, which is investigations, we will have a mock drill to where they're able to go through a mock investigation to see what our investigators endure when it's time to make a uh, determination as to the cause and origin of a fire. Well, this has been a great discussion, and certainly you've uh, provided some very important information. Uh, uh, Chief Sanders, we appreciate your service to the city of Jackson and our uh, Jackson Fire Department. You certainly represent the uh, department well and the city well. Uh, is there any final comments that you'd like to make in terms of contact information? Uh, anybody interested in getting into the uh, Citizen Fire Camp? Yes, sir. Uh, anyone who is interested in, in a um, uh, being a, a participant in the uh, academy, they can give me a call at 601-960-1498. The deadline to sign up will be October the 25th. And, you know, I encourage the citizens to take this time. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a free, uh, it's free. You don't have to pay anything. Only thing we want is your time to come out and share uh, in information and activities that we will provide for us, you know, being your Jackson local uh, fire department. 
Chief Cleo Sanders. Thank yes, you for sir. your service again, right. sir. Yes, sir. We'll be right back with WAJ City View. The Jackson Community Garden Initiative is one of many projects sponsored by Keep Jackson Beautiful. We're a nonprofit that not only educates the public about recycling and environmental issues, but is a growing network of volunteers and other partners, including the city of Jackson. We're all dedicated to keeping Jackson beautiful and a great place to live through community service and neighborhood projects. To be a part of Keep Jackson Beautiful, call 601-953-1123 or visit us at keepjacksonbeautiful.com. Welcome back to WAJ City View. We now have in our studio, Ms. Tracy Wade, who is the community manager for the American Cancer Society. She operates in the metropolitan, Jackson metropolitan area. We're glad to have her in the studio. Welcome, ma'am. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's so uh, good to have you in the studio. I know you are going to be talking about a very, very important topic. Uh, talking about breast cancer awareness and certainly uh, cancer as a whole and the fighting for the cure for cancer. So what we'd like for you to do, uh, Ms. Wade, is just start off by telling us a bit about yourself, your role with the American Cancer Society, and talk about this important month to, to your agency. Well, um, I have been with the American Cancer Society as an employee for five years. Um, started out as a volunteer. Um, got involved because my grandmother was diagnosed with breast cancer and um, was looking for a way to do something so I wouldn't feel like I was helpless in the situation. And so I started working with them and got involved with the Making Strides Against Breast Cancer Walk and that's the event that I'm responsible for. And I'm really passionate about it because, because I had, I've lost a grandmother and an aunt to breast cancer. For me, it's very important to raise awareness as well as funds for research and also for programs and services for patients while they're going through their journey. That's one thing about this disease, this, this awful disease called cancer, it has touched some of everybody. I, I imagine every person on the planet has had at least a, what we say, a family member, a friend, mm -hmm. an associate that has been touched by cancer. Uh, I myself had a dear, dear uncle of mine, his wife and their daughter all were diagnosed with cancer. Uh, the only one that's a cancer survivor is my aunt. Uh, and I lost my cousin, who was the first cousin, who was very close to me, uh, Lisa Wade, uh, that same name you I told her we were going to check our tree and see if we are connected. But uh, she, she uh, succumbed to cancer uh, in 2008 at the uh, young age of 44. So, you know, when you think about those uh, situations, they, they, they really, you know, touch you deep uh, because it's, uh, you know, it then, it, it's not, cancer that is not respectful of age. So it could, it, could, no. it could test the babies all the way up into, you know, our seniors. So talk a bit about what American Cancer Society is doing, not only just to fight the cure for a cure, but also awareness. Talk a bit about that. Well, the American Cancer Society has been around for over 100 years and with the central mission of curing cancer. And we look at cancer from multiple perspectives. We look at prevention, we look at treatment, and we look at survivorship. So all of the research that's being done all over the world that's funded through the American Cancer Society, it's focused on finding ways to prevent, finding better treatment, and ultimately enabling survivors to be able to live longer. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, we're really, really passionate about is getting people aware of their risk factors um, and understanding that prevention is not just about us figuring out a cure, it's about figuring out those things that are in our environment that affects our cancer risk. Things like getting good exercise, being active on a consistent basis, eating right. And that can be very hard when you start to have those conversations with people because nobody really wants to have that conversation about, oh, I don't need that, that fried piece of chicken. I don't need to eat this processed meat. Um, but it's about finding ways to help people live healthier, to help reduce their risk. Mm -hmm. And I know how important that is, uh, certainly being educated on the signs and certain symptoms of, of cancer, uh, certainly in this, you know, very uh, uh, infant stages is critical in uh, order to find a cure. What are some, I know breast cancer is one of the more deadly uh, forms of cancer and it's certainly, I'm sure, an astronomical figure in terms of how many women have died and me and some men uh, mm -hmm. to breast cancer. Uh, but what are some of the other cancers that, you know, have the tendency to be very prevalent, certainly within an urban community like Jackson? Well, 
for the most part within the state of Mississippi, we look at breast, lung, colorectal, and um, different types of what we call uh, female cancers, mm -hmm. ovarian, mm -hmm. and uh, cervical. Mm -hmm. um, and so often, the reason they end up being deadly is because people don't find it early enough. They're not going to the doctor to do the preventative uh, wellness checks to have those conversations with their doctors about those subtle symptoms that uh, can be prevalent in those types of uh, cancers. Because one thing about breast cancer, we found a way to effectively identify it earlier with mammograms, ultrasounds, and ultimately doing biopsies. But things like ovarian and cervical cancer, those symptoms are very subtle. And a lot of times women don't know until it's too late. Um, Colorectal cancer is the one cancer we call preventable. Mm -hmm. And that's because if you get the colonoscopy and the polyps are removed before they invade your body, you're cured. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come back. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things they're just trying to get people to understand, go get the screening. Mm -hmm. And trying to find ways to get people more access to those types of screenings. i tell you one of the things that's troubling me as a almost 48 year old African American male uh, and I know women too are having a similar struggle right now because you know you, you're getting bad information from the media about when you should go and get those tests done mm -hmm. for example for, for men they'll tell you to do the colonoscopy at 50 that's the optimum age mm -hmm. that the you know medical profession encourage you to do it but but it's unfortunate because a lot of african americans have a history of mm -hmm. you know colon cancer and it's genetics and so a lot of times like with my cousin that's what she died from uh, colon cancer and so again you know i'm a little nervous because they're telling me to wait i got two mm -hmm. more years till i hit the big five oh obviously and right. what i'm saying is, is is american cancer society acs doing anything to help encourage uh physician insurance providers to be able to allow people to get these screenings earlier? Is that anything y'all doing? That is actually something we've been very involved with. Our advocacy arm, what we call our American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. They work a lot with advocacy, working with both state and federal governments to improve access to care. And also, we worked a lot in respect to the Affordable Care Act, what everyone loves to call Obamacare, mm -hmm. to try and create create those gaps mm -hmm. that existed in existing health insurance. Needless to say, health insurance companies are not interested in us creating those type of situations, but we encourage people to have those conversations with their doctors, mm -hmm. give some pushback in respect to their insurance companies to cover these things for their patients who have a history in their family. Mm -hmm. You know, because we may say the guideline is 50 and over for a colonoscopy, but there's also that second line of that guideline that says, if you have a family history, then you need to have these tests done earlier. Mm -hmm. Have those conversations with your doctor. And honestly, doctors actually have the ability to advocate for you with your insurance company and say, this person needs to have this sooner. They have a history in their family and we wanna do a screening earlier. Um, I'll give you an example. Because of my grandmother and my aunt being diagnosed with breast cancer, mm -hmm. I was able to get a mammogram earlier than 40 mm -hmm because of the history in my family mm -hmm. so that they were able to have a baseline test. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, that's the other point, as I was saying, it's not just with men at my age, but even with women, when you talk about mammograms and, and, and going and getting uh, those other tests that go along with detecting breast cancer earlier, tell you to, them to also wait so long before they have those tests done. Yeah. I just think that's a, certainly a disservice uh, to you, to the to their customer, because mm -hmm. we as the, the the person who uh, is, is paying the insurer, uh, we should uh, have some say so, I would think, in right. getting these tests done. It's not like any of us. I'm just going to be a little humorous, but it's a serious deal. It's not like men are just running and itching to get a colonoscopy, right? Right. But if you are concerned about, as you said, some type of genetic issue that mm -hmm. might be running your family, and like I told my physician, I said, yeah, it's not my parents and it's not my siblings but when you talk about a first cousin I still mm -hmm. say that's a lot close to you know mm -hmm. being a immediate family member uh, then I would like to you know get you because she didn't see that coming and uh, you know it just it really took her down fast and yeah. again I'm, I'm, I'm not 
shame or shy to say that I'm concerned about that, uh, you know, sitting here today. So I do hope and trust you all do continue mm -hmm. to fight that battle because, yeah. again, when you go into your uh, uh, medical provider and they tell you, well, you can get that uh, test done, but at this age, I don't think your insurance is going to uh, pay for it. That's a problem. Yeah. That's yeah. a real problem. It's a real problem, and it's a very real problem, mm -hmm. unfortunately, mm -hmm. in this country is mm -hmm. that people are unable to get the kind of care they deserve to get because we have to deal with the issues in respect to health insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that we continue to fight. And, and I'm gonna be honest, the lobbyists fight very hard against us with a lot of what we do. We fight with volunteers, they fight with paid lobbyists. Mm -hmm. um, so when we go to Capitol Hill, we go with a flood of volunteers from all over the country who go and speak to their senators and their representatives about these are the changes we need to have made. Um, we had one major win here in the state of Mississippi in 2015, because at one point, oral chemo would cost a patient a different price than going to the hospital and get IV chemo. Mm -hmm. And um, I know for my grandmother, that was detrimental for her. Her doctor wanted her to be on oral chemo, but her Medicare didn't pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, but now, with the cancer fairness uh, treatment bill that passed, in the state of Mississippi, health insurance companies now have to make that a parity in respect to cost. Well, before we close out this segment, allow me to put in a shameless plug for the city of Jackson, <laughs> because we were one of the first, I know major cities uh, in the southeast region to go smokeless, quite frankly. That is so correct. one of the things that I, I remember very fondly, actually, as a young city councilman, I had the uh, honor of casting the deciding vote on making sure uh, Jackson was smoke free, and certainly mm -hmm. we have a healthier community because of that. Definitely. But I want to give you all more credit than what we did as city council members. You all brought the issue to us. Mm -hmm. And because of your representative with your fine organization, we were actively set the tone. And I understand there are numerous cities throughout oh, yes. the state of Mississippi. Uh, and I don't know if this has the state gone smoke free yet? The I'm state sure. has not gone smoke free mm -hmm. completely yet. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain segments um, that are, I think, like state office buildings mm -hmm. have, are smoke free. Mm -hmm. Um, but in respect to truly having a state free, a state of Mississippi smoke, smoke free, free comprehensive law, mm -hmm. that has not happened. Um, and some of that, you know, has to do with some of the businesses in the state that don't want us to go completely smoke free. Um, but we're encouraging, continuing to work with each of the cities to try and ultimately get that done across the state. Well, I can safely say that you all have some of the best lobbyists in America. So tell them <laughs> to keep on lobbying. We gonna keep they on lobbied, doing. they lobbied us and. Uh, they, they, they did a fantastic job, but it was not a hard sell for the members who voted in uh, support of Jackson going smoke-free. And like I say, I know the citizens of Jackson are better for it. Uh, I'm sure there were some that are smokers who were not uh, pleasant, pleased with that, but I'm sure if it extended some years onto their lives, I'm sure oh, yeah. that they are, are appreciative of that. But again, uh, we appreciate you being here today. We'll, we'll, we'll have you back, and we want to acknowledge again that October is... Uh, Cancer Awareness Month, mm -hmm. and uh, so we want to make sure that we encourage all of our viewers to support uh, your activities. I understand y'all have a walk or Yeah, the up? Making Strides Against Breast Cancer Walk mm -hmm. is coming up Saturday, October 22nd. We're starting from Thalumara Hall uh, in front of the Pink Fountain, <laughs> and uh, we're really excited about this year's event. We're expecting probably anywhere around 8,000 people generally come out to help us celebrate our survivors and remember those that we've lost. Well, let me put this disclaimer in because people know me. I, I do participate in 5K runs and 10K runs, and I will be a participant in this run if my wife allows me to because it is a birthday that weekend, mm -hmm. and so if she wants to spend a part of her birthday weekend on that 5K, we will be out there together running. All right. If you don't see me, she said no. Okay, okay. I want you to say that. Well, I appreciate you coming and running in the rain last year. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and, and, and like I say, anytime I can, I'm going to be there to support you all. And uh, certainly Mary Arbor, uh, Tony Arbor uh, supports uh, your agency as well and your efforts in making sure that citizens are aware of this deadly disease and that a cure is on its way. Is there a contact number, a name and number you want to give them? If um, they want they to can give you? us a call here locally at 601-321-5500 to get more information about the walk or even to volunteer. It's Tracy Wade with the American Cancer Society. Thank, Thank you again you. for coming in and visiting with us. We'll have you back real soon. All right. All right. We'll be right back with WAJ City View.
Hi, I'm Mayor Tony Arbor. And I'm Jackson Police Chief Lee Vance. Here in the city of Jackson, we recognize that you're our number one crime fighting resource. So we're providing you with a tool to help us respond to criminal activity in a timely manner. Tip 411 allows residents to text or submit crime tips. Your name is not important, your information is. Officers will receive your messages and react in real time. My number one priority is your safety. This tool helps us work together to make Jackson a safer place. Well, thank you for tuning in again to WAJ We Are Jackson City View. Again, this uh, program is designed to make sure that we bring important topics uh, to the forefront that we think uh, that are certainly uh, ass will assist our citizens in uh, learning the, the great things that are going on in our capital city. We'll be doing segments of, uh, from time to time, and they will be dealing again with public health and public safety. Two very important issues to this administration, to the city of Jackson, and certainly we want to uh, make sure that you have an opportunity to learn what's going on in your capital city. Continue to tune in, and until next time, have a great day.